Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I'm your host, Liv, back again with a Pride episode. This one, though, not quite mythology, something a bit new and different for us, but equally cool and important and honestly, super excited for it. Because you see, this woman was very real. Now, I've already spent the last couple of weeks emphasizing the tragedy that tends to be inherent in myths revolving around two men in love. One of them is always a god and the mortal always has a tragic end or at best a tragic life. As for stories about two women, we just tend to not have them. This isn't because there weren't women who loved other women back then, or even because there weren't myths and stories of women loving other women. It's just that if those did exist, which I imagine they did, they didn't make their way to us for one reason or another. That reason is almost definitely the patriarchal nature of that world and the lack of agency women had in general, let alone in the mythology where they basically never have voices or opinions or, you know, seem like whole human people at all. But that all falls away when you look at this very real woman, the poet of Lesbos, who built a career on her songs and poetry, who became famous as all hell, and who sang about the ladies she liked. Sappho. A huge thank you to the Sweet Bitter podcast for both sharing some of their early research that was done by Elise for that show, it's helped so much, but also the inspiration in general. Those ladies did an entire season all about Sappho and her work, and two of the hosts have already been on this show, my show, to talk about Sappho, and the third, Lisa, is coming up this week on Friday. So if you're into Sappho or poetry or a host of other things, I highly recommend you listen to the podcast Sweet Bitter. But in the meantime... This is episode 130, Speak Radiant Liar, the poetess of Lesbos, Sappho, and other women of that world. Eros de temas de moi frenas os animos cat drusin empeton. Eros shook my mind like a mountain wind falling on oak trees. Yes, that was my inaugural podcast attempt at reading ancient Greek, let alone archaic Iolic Greek. Sappho Fragment 47 Sappho is one of those names that most people have at least heard in their lives. You've heard the name Sappho or the word sapphic, or at the absolute least, you've heard the word lesbian. And all of those come from this so-called 10th muse, the poetess of Lesbos, Sappho. Sappho was a poet on, yes, the island of Lesbos, hence lesbian, during the Archaic period. That is, the 7th century. She was born around 612 BCE, making her quite ancient in terms of the sources that we know so well. Lesbos is far off in the northwest of the Aegean. It's remote and nowhere near the Greek mainland, much closer to what is now Turkey. As for the timeline and where Sappho sits within it, people like Hesiod and the possible Homer would have come before her, but she came long before the playwrights, the tragedians, and other notable people from the world of classical Greece, particularly classical Athens. She is also the only woman poet of the Archaic period that we have explicit evidence for. There are suggestions of others, references here and there, even by Sappho herself, but nothing explicit enough to be entirely sure that another woman was writing poetry at the same time as Sappho. Still, I mean, it was likely, let's be honest, she didn't exist in a vacuum. 
Sappho was certainly the first woman poet of ancient Greece in terms of the evidence we have. However, as much as she's often called the first woman poet ever, she is in fact not. The claim that she was the first woman poet is a Eurocentric myth that leaves out a Sumerian woman who came about 1,500 years before Sappho. 1,500 years. Her name was Enheduanna, and one day I will find enough sourcing to talk about her, too. Today, though, Sappho, and some of those who came after her. It's just important that you know that Sappho was not the first woman poet, nor did the first recorded poet come from Greece at all, or Europe at all. The first recorded poet ever was not only a woman, but the first recorded poet in history was the Sumerian woman named Enheduanna from modern Iraq. Because everything Westerners think of Iraq now is because of colonialism and warmongering and nothing to do with the people, the history, or the culture. Plato famously called Sappho the Tenth Muse. She was that prolific and well-known. Plato was alive in the 5th and 4th centuries, so we're talking hundreds of years after Sappho. I explain that because it's a perfect example of just how famous and important Sappho was both in her time and beyond it. She wasn't just any old poet whose fragments have survived. She was fucking famous. And of course, that's not even mentioning that Plato lived on the mainland in Attica in Athens, whereas Sappho was from Lesbos, an island in the Mediterranean, far in the Mediterranean. Her poems and her fame traveled a long way. A true badass. Perokos os ot aidos o lesbios allodopoisin. Outstanding as the lesbian singer compared to those elsewhere. Sappho Fragment 106 Like you've now heard, much of Sappho's poetry, in fact almost all of it, survives only in fragments. Small pieces varying in length of what would have been full poems sung as songs. So many fragments of Sappho are just single words or a couple of words with gaps and missing pieces. It's both frustrating and fascinating, and if you're looking for a book of her poetry, I highly recommend Anne Carson's Fragments of Sappho. It renders the fragments and their missing pieces in a very meaningful and effective way. Archaic poets in ancient Greece basically always sang their poems along to music. It wasn't like we think of it now, spoken word or anything. These were songs. That's why Homer repeats himself so often, or why he uses so many long-winded similes. They're like choruses and stanzas. These were ways of memorizing the lyrics, of keeping people entertained, and of fitting the stories to a tune. Sappho was a musician, a singer, a poet... She would play the lyre and sing her poems to a crowd. She would teach them to groups of women on Lesbos. She shared her songs and her talents, and they made her famous throughout the Hellenic world. Sappho sung her poems just like Homer or Hesiod, though she didn't sing songs of epic heroes. Her poems were more down-to-earth, more of what the average person would think and feel on a given day, the average woman. Her poems were introspective and looked at the lives of women in a way that we all know Hesiod and Homer did not do. Ever. <laughs> Hesiod speaks of women like they're objects to be used as one sees fit, if not way worse. Homer is a little better, but barely. Neither spoke of women like real humans with lives and inner thoughts. Sappho, though, did exactly that. She sung of real life, of real emotions, and notably, she often sang love songs about other women. Aelthes ego de simaioman, on de epsucas iman frena kaiomenan pothoi. You came and I was crazy for you, and you cooled my mind that burned with longing. Sappho Fragment 48 while we do get the word sapphic and lesbian from our girl Sappho, she did appear to also enjoy the company of men. There's a bit of controversy there, with some saying she was definitely a lesbian who wasn't interested in men, and others who translate her poems to be explicitly about men. But it seems to me, and many others, that if Sappho were alive today, she would probably identify as bisexual or maybe even pan. 
Sappho did have a husband, though there's some talk about whether that in itself was a joke or a snide comment on her sexuality. It said that her husband was a man named Kyrkilos of Andros, but it seems like the name Kyrkilos isn't one we hear much otherwise, if it's ever referenced beyond Sappho's supposed husband. And it apparently has some phallic connotations, being possibly derived from a word meaning, well, penis. And yes, Andros is an island of Greece, but it also means man... So there's a bit of controversy over whether or not she did indeed have a husband, and if she did, was his name really Dick of Man Island? She does, however, write about a daughter, which would certainly require a tick on the whole husband checklist in ancient Greece. My money is on her husband simply having a different name, one that was not a dick joke, and that that bad joke came later when writers were insulting her love of women and men. Because regardless of the questionable nature of her supposed husband's name, which is not referenced by Sappho herself, but by someone later, it doesn't sound unreasonable to me that she would indeed have a husband. If we're to understand her as at least bi, which her poetry does suggest, then she would likely have a husband either because, you know, she loved him and married him, or she married a man because it was easier to be a married woman with a career and freedoms than it was a single woman, or, you know, both... Like, I don't want to pass judgment on whether or not she was married because I think discounting that possibility discounts her overall queer nature, her probable bisexuality, and instead it dives into the dark realm of questioning a woman's queerness just because she may have chosen to have a relationship with a man while still loving and being attracted to women. Over the years, there's been quite an effort to suggest that Sappho didn't, in fact, love other women. She had a husband and a daughter, they would say. They would say she was writing poems about women for other people, men, one would assume. Or that she was speaking metaphorically, or not sexually, platonically. So many ways to bend over backwards just to suggest that this incredibly famous, incredibly talented poet was not also queer. Are we surprised? Of course we're not. I'm sure it was very hard for people to accept that there was a famous woman poet in the first place, but add to that that she wrote love songs for other women? A woman would never! O Kala, O Kauri, Sakura. O beautiful, O graceful one. Sappho Fragment 108. Though her words to these women are fragmentary, there are three women's names that come up, varying in frequency, in Sappho's poetry. Atis, Anactoria, and Gongola. Often these names are used in longing, with Attis going off with a woman named Andromeda, though it's possible Andromeda herself could have been a woman poet teaching other women on Lesbos, apparently. Even still, that could to be true, and Addis could have still gone off with her for reasons more than just learning to write and sing poetry. Lesbos, in general, appears to have been a bit of a hotbed when it comes to women freely loving who they wanted. A later writer described a woman he was into, who was from Lesbos, as gaping after another woman. And in theater, the island of Lesbos was often connected with this kind of freedom of love and sex though it was described in much less complimentary terms, as we would all assume. But what of Sappho's explicitly loving or erotic poetry geared towards women? As I've said, her work survives mostly in fragments, tragically. So there isn't a lot, and even less when it comes to eroticism. Apparently, many scholars suggest that that means she never wrote erotic poetry about women. Though... Sarah Pomeroy states bluntly in her book, Goddesses, Whores, Wives, and Slaves, Women in Antiquity, that Greeks were definitely aware that Sappho wrote about women's sexual activity. There's a fragment of papyrus where Sappho has clearly written the word meaning leather phallus, apparently. So we've got at least one dildo clearly stated on the record. And as Pomeroy continues with this vein, quote, Part of another poem preserved on parchment relates, On a soft bed you satisfied your desire. Pomeroy goes on to explain that, yes, the word you in ancient Greek can mean a man or a woman, but Sappho is not known to have written erotic poetry for men. Optaius ame, 
You burn me. Sappho Fragment 38 Pomeroy's entire section on women and poetry in this book is fascinating, frankly, and I won't be able to do it justice here. But she makes mention of the traditions in Sparta that allowed for relationships between older and younger women. I kind of feel like maybe this suggests a kind of pederastic relationship, which we all know is horrifying, but perhaps it might also suggest women of adulthood with women older than them, one can hope. In speaking of this, she specifically mentions a woman named Hagesikora, who is mentioned in the poetry by a Spartan poet who wrote maiden songs, hymns sung by unmarried women and girls. In one of these, they say, quote, Hagesikora exhausts me. Hagesikora, it seems, was the leader of this choir group. Pomeroy explains in a slightly adjusted quote, We may choose to interpret this phrase as praising Hagesikora, or trying to win at a festival, or sexually and emotionally. The point of this is to note that it seems that relationships between women, homoerotic attachments specifically, were fostered in places like Sparta and Lesbos. They were accepted. They were okay. Totally normal. Beauty was cultivated in these circles. Lesbos even had a beauty contest. And women like Sappho and Hagesikora were accomplished and therefore attractive to those around them of both sexes. Pomeroy's ultimate point, which I will make in her words, is, quote, Women did not, as has been suggested, turn to other women in desperation due to a man's disparagement of them. Rather, it appears they could love other women in milieu where the society cherished women, educated them comparably to men of their class, and allowed them to carry into maturity the attachments they had formed in the all-female social educational context of youth. To put it clearly, in places like this, women were allowed to love who they wanted, they were educated at the same level of men, and they were just given the freedom to be who they were. And in that freedom, they chose to be with other women in romantic and sexual relationships. Ereti Parthenius Epibalomai do I still yearn for my virginity? Sappho Fragment 107 Although Sappho is the only woman poet that we know of from the Archaic period, there were a number of women later on whose fragmentary works or references to those works remain. In the 5th century, there were women who carried on the torch of Archaic lyric poetry in this style of Sappho, Corinna, Telesilla, and Praxilla. And yes, Praxilla appears in Assassin's Creed Odyssey as the poet in Boeotia who gives zero fucks about anything except her lyre. A true icon. From what I can find, we don't know much more about these women than their names, their professions, but Diane Rayer, whose book we're moving on to in sourcing here, also writes of an early Hellenistic poet named Irina. Irina, it seems, was inspired specifically by Sappho's use of the very personal I, something not common at this time, but really impactful. Irina's poetry was more of what we think of today. It was meant to be read or spoken, but not sung. Arina wrote about herself with this I of Sappho, specifically about her own grief and loss over a friend's death. I wanted to mention Arina within the Sappho episode, not only because she is an example of a much later poet inspired by our 10th muse, but because of what she wrote and why. Arina wrote about loss, her own grief, and her memories of a friend who died young, shortly after her marriage. Her marriage, it seems, was the cause of her death. This poem remains only in fragments, but the emotions and intention are clear. 
She is lamenting her friend's death, how they won't be able to grow old together. She remembers how they played together as children. Her friend's death causes her to have a fear of marriage, but simultaneously she has the desire to leave her family's home. As Rayer says bluntly, quote, In this poem, Irina explores women's fear of loneliness, marriage, death, and aging. Not only is Irina writing of close friendships, women in general, and normal everyday women and the issues they faced, but specifically focusing on fears around marriage and simultaneously not getting married. Marriage was terrifying and pregnancy was even more terrifying. It often caused death. But at the same time, not getting married meant you would live in your parents' home forever as a spinster with nothing of your own. This is a very real look at the lives of women in this world, presumably beyond the realm of Sparta and Lesbos where they might have had a little bit more freedom. Because it wasn't universal, neither of these things, but it was common and normal to have these types of constraints placed upon women. And it's rare that I get to examine this from a historical standpoint rather than mythological, and it's important. Lato kai nioba mala men philai eisan itairai. Leto and Niobe were beloved friends. Sappho Fragment 142. <laughs> Oi men ipehon stroton oi depesdon, oi denaon phias epigan malainan, emenai kaliston, ego decain ototis aretai. Some men say an army of horses, and some men say an army on foot, and some men say an army of ships is the most beautiful thing on the black earth, but I say it is love. A portion of Sappho Fragment 16, or also called Poem 4. While I would argue that Sappho stands alongside men like Hesiod and Homer in terms of literary and cultural importance in ancient Greece, as I've already mentioned, she made sure she wrote very differently from those men who came before her. She made a conscious effort not to adhere to those literary traditions that they'd set out. Yes, she tended to write more about humanity and values understood by women and of women's lives and generally daily life rather than epic. But she did wade into the realm of Homeric epic and provide a bit of her own view of it. The bit of Fragment 16 that I just read now is an example of that, but it only becomes more obvious as the poem goes on. Because here Sappho is specifically comparing herself to those men who wrote of epics, of armies and fleets of ships and war and adventure. Those men believe that armies and horses and ships are the most beautiful things on earth. Sappho believes it's love. The poem goes on to sympathize with Helen, discussing her decision to go off with Paris for love and taking away some of the blame that's been placed on her for that decision. Sappho questions the blame over the war. Is the woman who chose love over her husband to blame for a war, or is it the men who went to war over her choice? Sappho goes on to link this to her own absent love, a woman named Anactoria, who she laments as being gone from her. This is all from Diane Rayer's book on ancient poets, and she phrases the ultimate point of the poem best, quote, just as Helen preferred Paris over Menelaus, the best man of all, so the speaker would rather see the absent Anactoria than the traditionally male-valued glitter of war. Where those famous epic poets saw the most beauty and importance in war and violence and dominance, Sappho saw it in love, in passion, in daily life. She saw it in being a woman with the freedom to love whoever she wanted and to show it through her words. Agi de kelu dia moi lege funaiasa diginio. Yes, radiant liar, speak to me, become a voice. 
Sappho Fragment 118 Oh, you wonderful nerds, especially to you lesbian and women identifying bi nerds, this one's for you. I've wanted to do this Sappho episode forever. She's fascinating and incredible and so important. I mean, that I also happen to be learning how to pronounce ancient Greek was just a bit fitting. That made it extra fun. She's just so important. It's important that we know about her. It's important that we know how famous she was back then, how revered. It's important that we know that she definitely enjoyed the love and company of men and women. Sappho is important. But Sappho is also from the 7th century BCE. This is part of what makes her important, but it is also the main issue that I have with an episode on her. Because, you know, we don't have a ton of biographical information for a woman who lived 2,800 years ago on a small island to the northeast of mainland Greece. Far, far from Athens, where so much of our sourcing comes from. One piece we do have on Sappho is in Ovid's Heroides, but his entry on Sappho is an utter disgrace. It's likely based on later ideas and stereotypes and almost insulting sourcing on her, jokes about her insults. In Ovid's Heroides, she throws herself off of a cliff because a man doesn't love her. It's horrible and not very sapphic. This is truly when I will say... Fuck Ovid's Heroides, he really dropped the ball with Sappho. Which is why that is the only reference I'm making to it in this whole episode. Because this episode is about what we do know of the real Sappho, not a stereotype of her from Roman times. She was a real woman, not a mythical one. Though the idea of her has been mythologized in a fascinating way, hence why I'm covering her here. Anyway, this was really fun and interesting, and I know just from my posting an image of her on Instagram that so, so many of you have been waiting for this and are excited for it, so I'm thrilled to finally give you Sappho and lyrics of her too. Did I slightly butcher the ancient Greek? Definitely, but was it fun and not as bad as it could have been? Absolutely. All fragments and translations are from Anne Carson's If Not Winter, Fragments of Sappho. As for the information itself, ugh, two books were where most of this came from. Sappho's Lyre, Archaic Lyric and Women Poets of Ancient Greece by Diane Rayer. It provided so much about Sappho's time and her style and the poetry itself, along with the other women poets from later on. And Goddesses, Whores, Wives and Slaves, Women in Antiquity is a badass book by Sarah B. Pomeroy that provided more information on Sappho and women, women of Lesbos, women of Greece, all of that good stuff. Thank you all so much for listening. You're just the best. Friday, a conversation with my friend Lisa Charlotte from the Sappho podcast, Sweet Better, about Sappho's bisexuality and a fascinating and recent bout of drama when it comes to our understanding of her and her surviving poetry. Fucking love Sappho. I am live and I love this shit. (laughs) 